Doctors in lab coats are the frontline soldiers when it comes to swaying public opinion on health and dietary issues, for which they are handsomely paid by big business. But that doesn't impress everyone. Many still remember Philip Morris used to use doctors to promote smoking as a harmless or even healthy activity. Diet and health advice from the authorities is often contradictory and illogical, which has made many grow skeptical. That's why they've had to bring in the big guns. It's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> which, as a brain surgeon, is what I do. Brain surgery? <laughs> Not exactly rocket science. <laughs> it always amuses me when fitness influencers invoke the laws of thermodynamics. While the laws of thermodynamics are rock solid, they simply don't say what some people seem to think they say. So today I'm going to respond to one such video and explain why this logic fails. Dr. Mike Isretel is hardly the worst of YouTube fitness. His video just checks all the boxes of similar videos citing the laws of thermodynamics for diet, so I thought it would be a good one to respond to. And I can only manage to watch so much of Lane Norton. It turns out that hormones and keto and Magic. Wait, wait, no, no. No, Kaiko's not a myth, and the idea that it's a myth is BS all safe swearing for the end of this. So, the idea that calories in, calories out is a myth is promulgated and propagated by various folks in the fitness industry. And it turns out that it's not a myth. So, let's get into the realities. First, Calories in, calories out is essentially covered in the mass energy conservation principle, a.k.a. the first law of thermodynamics. Right off the bat, he has made the same mistake every guy who's taken an exercise physiology class makes. Conservation of mass comes from E equals MC square. Even this is not wholly true, and mass does not come into the laws of thermodynamics at all which is why it's odd to bring them up when talking about weight loss. I've looked at the Wikipedia page for this many times over the years, and every time it's different. It is often difficult to say what on earth they're talking about, even though I know the laws of thermodynamics in and out already. Originally, and in the version I learned, the first law states a closed system retains its energy unless it performs work upon the outside environment. The second law says within a closed system, the energy within a system, that is the heat, will equalize over time. You can test this for yourself by buying a really good thermos. Put some water and ice inside and leave it there overnight. When you wake up in the morning, you won't have some water with some ice in it. You'll have a sort of slushy. This is not the ice falling apart and spreading out, but the energy flowing out of the ice and equalizing throughout the thermos until eventually the ice is melted and reformed into small bits all throughout the container. Being a closed system is important here, that is, keeping the thermos lid closed. Otherwise the energy, heat, flows out of the neck of the thermos and in the morning the ice will be gone and the water will be at room temperature. This is exactly what happens to your body every second of the day. Your body produces heat, then the heat flows right out of the body and into the air in the ground around you. This is a large part of the reason why burning calories from exercise is misleading, and it's the reason that the calories that enter the body can be largely irrelevant to what stays in the body. And this is true without breaking the laws of physics, which we always obey in this household. Lisa, get in here! <laughs> In this house, we obey the laws of thermodynamics! We can calculate the actual work energy of exercise and calories, and it's negligible even for running. When they talk about calories burned for exercise, that is not usually how they measure it. 
they measure the heat produced instead. The problem here is the more heat your mitochondria produce now, the more it turns down their production of heat later through the day. When you exercise daily, slowly over time your body simply stops producing as much heat and lets you do the work for it during the exercise. This actually drives down your base metabolism, which comes almost entirely from mitochondrial heat generation. You might assume that your heat production is only stable and, and it just keeps your body at 98.6 degrees at all times. But like most things in the body, this is driven by feedback and hormones and fluctuates over time. And the average body temperature is dropping. Today it is 1.5 degrees less than it was 50 years ago. This is mainly due to mitochondrial damage from a high carb, high PUFA modern diet, eating franken foods that didn't even exist 200 years ago, but excessive exercise can also cause problems in this regard. People say, look, I know Keiko is real, but I like ate a crap ton of calories for months. I didn't gain weight. And then another time I ate almost nothing and I gained weight. And it turns out that people are just really bad on average, tons of exceptions, of course, and you're one of them, of accounting for diet and activity. And they're just really bad at tracking. So they'll think they ate something where in reality they forgot it was this much versus that much. They mismeasured. They say they did 30 minutes of cardio, but they reduced their daily walking and they never measure that. So because they misconstrued it, they say, hey, look, you know, typical thing I'll see on social media is someone will be like, look, I've been in a surplus, but I'm not gaining. Uh, how do you know you're in a surplus? Assumption, 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 incorrect three assumptions. They're not really in a surplus. So that's definitely a thing that happens. The last bit is important. What is a caloric surplus? For calories in, calories out to work, a surplus must mean you are simply eating more food than you were when at equilibrium. If you can eat 1500 calories a day and go to 2000 calories a day without gaining weight, then the whole idea is nonsense. What actually happens is your body tries hard to maintain equilibrium, whatever your current weight is. In the age of hot air ballooning, a French pioneer took a trip up and saw another man in a balloon about 100 yards away, next to a fog bank. This was quite astonishing because he was one of the few in the world who had both the technical acumen and the means for such an activity. Whenever he increased the heat to generate more lift, the other balloon went down even as he went up. Whenever he dropped down a bit, the other balloon went up. In the end, he gave up on trying to maneuver up or down to catch a current and get closer, and eventually the mist swallowed the other balloon and it disappeared. This was probably some unusual weather phenomenon, but some even believe it was an otherworldly encounter. Regardless, this is exactly what happens when you try and lose or gain weight. If calories in, calories out was a useful model, it would be like flipping a switch. You eat 3,500 fewer calories and you lose a pound of fat. However, that's not true at all. And if you press them, the psycho proponents will talk about adaptation over time, blah, blah, blah. But they will always try and pass it off as if it were a minor effect and has no bearing on the validity of psycho or calories in, calories out. In reality, to lose a pound of fat, you might have to eat around 3,500 calories less the first week, but after that you will have to eat significantly less, and each week it is typically less than the week before. And this is far in excess of what we'd expect from simple weight loss, because you're only losing about a pound or two per week. If the amount of weight loss is large enough, eventually you just stop losing weight, even if you're a large man and you eat only 1,200 or fewer calories a day. I know that's true because that's exactly what happened to me. I also know I didn't make any mistakes with my calories because all of my calories come from frozen TV dinners, or at least they did at that time, and I specifically did that so I'd be able to count my calories effectively. The calories on labels are not 100% accurate, but they are fairly close for most purposes. The real problem is that these garbage foods are not that good for weight loss. 
Promoting these kinds of foods as healthy is the reason the slogan calories in, calories out was coined. And even more so, your body just won't let you lose a large amount of weight all at once without slowing the metabolism. It is difficult to measure calories, that's true, but if anything this points out the uselessness of calories for a weight loss paradigm. If you're not eating packaged foods, there's just no way you're going to be able to accurately measure exactly what calories you're getting. At first I did think I was the one making mistakes, and I was just miscounting my calories. I see. You sure you just haven't made thousands of mistakes? Uh, no, no, I'm afraid not. But if I were really that fallible, then I am sure I would die at least 12 times every time I get in the car to go to the grocery store. The calories for each gram of macronutrient are also misstated. In fact, I would say it's simply a lie. For example, carbohydrate doesn't have 4 calories per gram. The FDA rounded this down from 4.5 calories. On the other hand, they list all fats as having 9 calories a gram. When cocoa butter, for example, has only 5.5 calories per gram. Kaiko is as real as it gets. Or so the Germans would have us believe. <laughs> I'm sure it sounds as real as it gets to most, but in reality it is very cunning sophistry that was dreamed up at a think tank funded by the Coca-Cola Corporation. This was certainly a sort of preemptive strike on the inherent weakness of psycho-nonsense that almost all of the energy in your body is produced as waste heat. That is why your body can simply turn off production almost completely when trying to stop you from losing weight. Your body doesn't really need calories. It can survive on as little as 800 calories virtually indefinitely if it has enough vitamins. What your body needs is nutrition and you will quickly die from many nutritional deficiencies when malnourished, but not one person has ever died of lack of calories. That's why you simply can't starve your body for long periods to lose large amounts of weight, not without getting poor results anyway. Your body always has complete control of calories out and will thwart these efforts. It also has a great deal of control over the calories in by exerting hunger on you through ghrelin, insulin, cortisol, and other hunger-producing hormones. If threatened with long-term starvation, it will also sacrifice the rest of the body to ensure it can survive the perceived threat. While you know you can get food any time, in a natural environment someone would only eat reduced food for a very long period if they were in serious danger of starvation. A pea on toast? <laughs> One pea? Tell you I'm not far from cracking. <laughs> One of my professors made a memorable comment to me once. Anyone can take a ride in a nuclear submarine and think they understand how it works, but only a handful of people could possibly design or build one. My grandfather was a thermodynamic engineer and he worked for what later became NASA and also for what later became General Dynamics. When you make a space vehicle or nuclear reactor, there are many difficult aspects, but this is arguably the most difficult and complex part of the design process. Even today they are trying, and usually failing, to overcome many design issues in rocket engines that greatly limit their efficiency, even as many other areas have dramatically increased in capability. That's because it's really hard and takes a lot of brain power. When you pull thermodynamics into the equation, you simultaneously put the full weight of people like Werner von Braun into the argument, and also exclude even most scientists from being able to easily grasp what you are talking about. All of that elaborate misinformation just to attempt to push sugar on the public, using the prestige and reputation of much better men who are true scientists. Truly disgraceful. Next. People assume a stable metabolic rate when that rate can actually change. For example, if you are low on thyroid hormones, it can look like calories in, calories out doesn't work. 
except the calories out part is way down because your thyroid stopped working. And when you get on thyroid medication, all of a sudden calories in, calories out works again. It was never the calories in, calories out that was the problem. It was the fact that your hormonal systems were no longer pushing up that calories out part of the equation. If you have a thyroid issue and you're lucky enough for your doctor to properly diagnose you, he will just prescribe expensive hormonal treatments. These are not bioidentical and have weird side effects. He doesn't know or care what caused it. He has the meds. You have the blood work. It's time to charge the insurance. In reality, all autoimmune diseases have an origin in the gut and in defects in the immune system. Protein is supposed to be broken down to very small pieces before being absorbed, but if your gut is leaky and your stomach acid is weak from bacterial overgrowth, large chunks of protein can directly enter the body. This causes the immune system to develop antibodies against it over time, and your own body can be caught in the crossfire, a so-called autoimmune reaction. While both of these issues can be resolved by fasting, the cause is dietary. The sugar in wheat and oxalates destroy the gut, and so do a vast number of ingredients used as food additives, such as PEG, which thins out gut mucus and leaves the exposed endothelium open to damage. These agents also allow negative bacteria like H. pylori to thrive, which reduces stomach acid as a survival mechanism. A low-fat diet also has a similar effect, and packaged food and institutional food such as school lunches generally follow this formula. The danger of believing in psycho is that all this junk food is deemed to be perfectly acceptable in moderation. You might get away with a very small amount, but it is so ubiquitous that even if you try to completely eliminate it, you're probably getting way more than you think just from the few special occasions where you have some junk food. Even the food companies themselves often don't know all the ingredients in these industrialized food additives, which are global commodities that they just purchase from China or wherever and stick in their packaged food. I don't understand why you didn't go to the Food and Drug Administration. Well, most of those involved resigned. They're either out of the country or on vacation. Or they had been uh, paid off, that is the American way, you know. If you have a so-called restricted diet, as dietitians hilariously deem it, you know what you're getting. You don't have to eat only meat, but if you choose whole ingredients, avoid blending and mashing and stay away from high oxalate foods, sugar, wheat, and honey, you will have a diet that your body's hunger mechanisms are able to understand and deal with. It should also be one your gut is able to handle, though this will vary for everyone, but usually if you have a problem it's because of the damage you've done and there's ways to fix it, especially fasting and putting more animal fat into the diet. This alone should keep you from developing thyroid issues in the first place. In fact, it should greatly reduce the onset of all autoimmune disease. Type 1 diabetes in children, for example, is tightly linked to blood gluten levels in pregnant mothers. And that is just one way mere calories are a misleading measure of a food's cost, completely separate from insulin, ghrelin, and other important hormones. You may look at a packaged ice cream cone and see it as only 200 calories, but the long-term effects on your health and future weight gain could be much greater than you possibly imagine. Yet, is thyroid hormone all it's cracked up to be? Thyroid hormone is very catabolic, and while many claim it is the driver of the metabolism, in reality your mitochondria produce the vast majority of your basal metabolic rate. Thyroid hormone is really there mainly to process dietary intake, and large amounts are very harmful even though this does consume energy. If you want to increase your mitochondria and BMR, all you have to do is eat a low carb diet and or do some fasting. Both are shown to increase your mitochondrial function and total mitochondria count. In fact, keto diet adherents are shown to have as many as four times the number of mitochondria as people consuming higher carb diets. Water weight, another culprit. Water weight is humongous in this case. 
because people will assume that their body weight and tissue is the same thing, that they're reflexive proxy variables of each other. So what they'll say is, well, you know, I ate the this many calories and I just didn't lose weight. Insulin ultimately dictates both how much salt the body retains and also how much water it retains, not to mention your blood pressure as well. And it can still work quite well at the kidney level. And one of the jobs of uh, insulin at the kidney level is to actually hold on to sodium. So that's actually a, a much more important factor for increasing the sodium in your body and causing high blood pressure than is the amount of sodium that you consume. If you consume a, a modicum of sodium but have very high insulin levels, your body's going to try very hard to hold on to all of that sodium. You can, on the other hand, consume a whole lot of sodium but have very good low insulin levels and any excess sodium that can, you consume will just come out in your urine. People underestimate how much inflammation they can be carrying, especially with age. It should also be noted that inflammation on a physical level is simply holding too much water within your cells. When insulin goes down, the whole process stops cold and your macrophages can properly clean out senescent cells again, which prevents many of the effects of aging because without the insulin, you just don't hold on to that water and it just gets flushed out. So when you talk about losing water weight, you're really losing inflammation weight, which is very important to realize if you are trying to do more than just lose weight, if you're trying to get healthy. That is just one of the many reasons that fasting between 36 to 96 hours at a time is a superior way to lose weight. Unlike with a typical prolonged calorie cut, insulin drops rapidly so you never have to worry about not losing weight due to holding water or even going up in weight and having all kinds of weird stuff happening. You also quickly resolve health issues like arthritis and high blood pressure because these are based on inflammation and they simply can't exist while insulin is low in the body. Another thing is assuming a stability in digestion where there's definitely some flux going on. Some foods are harder or easier to digest, and there's not a one-to-one -one pairing of things that go into the mouth and things that end up getting anabolized into your tissues. Another way psycho is broken is that your body and your gut microbiome decide what to absorb and what not to. If you have a very large protein meal, your body doesn't blindly absorb every amino acid you eat. It has various transporters that come into play which prioritize nutrients. It's not going to take in gigantic amounts of trash aminos, but it will work quite hard to take in as much leucine and tryptophan as it can. That's good news for you as tryptophan triggers satiety in the brain, and leucine will reduce blood sugar spikes from meals and activate protein synthesis. Both of these will in turn help you to stick to your diet and have more lean tissue generation. That alone is a big blow to the idea of calories in, calories out, but in truth the calories from protein simply do not affect weight gain. I go into more detail about this in my last video about gluconeogenesis, but in short gluconeogenesis is controlled 100% by hormones, and the rate does not go up by consuming protein. Fat absorption is even more variable than protein absorption. With a low-fat meal, your body is starved for fat and tends to absorb most of it, but when you eat a fatty meal, your body won't take it all in. You have hard limits on how much fat you can take in from a meal, and that is one reason eating one meal a day can be a good strategy for some people. Your body can get all it needs from a single meal when you have nutrient-rich foods like animal products, but it simply can't take in more than it needs. When you go on a long diet, your gut microbiome changes in a negative way which causes fat to be absorbed much more readily. Conversely, when you fast, you kill off much of the negative bacteria and more of the excess fat simply passes right through you. This is just one of the many ways prolonged diets sabotage your ability to lose fat and in which fasting actually accelerates the process. Sometimes you gotta be patient to see it working out and you have to make sure that your assumptions are what they are. Be patient, plug in the right calories. If after a few weeks you don't see the changes, don't think Kaiko doesn't work. Just lower or raise your calories to what you think they should be to make your weight go up or down, and you've got a winning formula. And so does it work or not? 
This guy knows weight loss is super hard when you have a lot of weight to lose. He's probably seen it slow down to nothing even if he's not experienced it himself, but he probably just assumed they broke down on the diet. But carnivore diet adherents put this to the test and prove it's false. If psycho worked, the only logical way to diet would be to figure out the maintenance for your ideal body weight and eat exactly that every day, and this process is very easy when you're eating only meat. You would lose weight in direct proportion to how overweight you are, and the process would never halt or reverse. It would also happen surprisingly quickly. It wouldn't be the constant struggle full of mystifying failure that many people experience. Sadly, for large amounts of weight loss, none of these things work as expected by the calories in, calories out model. People on the carnivore diet tend to eat either pre-cut fatty steaks or pre-measured ground 80-20 beef. This makes it easy to comply with the diet in a way most people never could with a regular diet. And the results completely destroy what we expect in the psycho model. In fact, the main issue people have with the diet is they often eat too few calories and stymie their metabolism due to eating lean cuts of meat. Compliance is just not an issue on this diet. There's tons of carnivores out there who lost 100 or even 200 pounds. There's no carnivores I know of out there who lost 100 plus pounds and aren't overweight at all anymore. Even though they are sticking to their diet and eating an appropriate amount. Eventually the weight loss stops and that's it. Now they're eating the amount that a person of their ideal size should be, but simply not ever getting there. And it's not because they have bad genetics, but because the dieting process itself has destroyed their metabolism. Dieting for long periods to lose large amounts of weight simply doesn't work well. And unless you lose the body weight fasting, you will almost never wind up at your ideal body composition. I can't stop eating. I eat because I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy because I eat. It's a vicious cycle. When you do 36 to 96 hour fasts, not only do you lose pure fat, but you also typically in increase your lean tissue. And the leaner you are, the more growth hormone is released. This means the overweight will lose some skin and stomach tissue, while the frail will gain in those areas. Since the stomach itself releases ghrelin, the main hunger hormone, this means the overweight will get a reduced appetite from fasting, while the frail will gain an increased appetite. Just make sure the frail get enough protein and nutrients in their system when they break the fast. If you lose 100 pounds on a lengthy diet, the tissues in the stomach and skin won't shrink and you will have the same hunger and the same loose skin as someone 100 pounds larger. While I've talked about not losing weight when eating very low calories, I've also experienced it from the other end. I did an experiment once where I went on carnivore diet and tried to eat 10 pounds of meat a day for a month to see if I would put on weight. I didn't manage to eat 10 pounds every day, but I did eat at least 5 pounds every day, and I didn't gain any weight even though the calories consumed were truly epic. As I mentioned earlier, your body likes equilibrium, and your body can decide what and how much to absorb. When your insulin is low, such as during a carnivore diet, your blood is flooded with fatty acids. Due to osmotic pressure, this means your body simply won't absorb huge amounts of fat, and most of it will pass right through you if you eat a very large meal. Fat in a meal also blunts insulin response which feeds into this effect and is yet another reason a low-fat diet is a complete disaster in every way. I felt a tremendous change in my muscles and body composition at that time, but sadly I ran into trouble when I started eating large amounts of lean meat. But I will save that for its own video someday. But I have found that carnivore diet adherents who work out seem to have a much better body composition than I would expect yet they have a very natural look. So I think there really is something to the carnivore diet as far as improving your physique goes. I doubt I could stick to a carnivore diet permanently, but my physique had surprising improvements even though I was not stronger or bigger and had neither lost nor gained weight. This is another aspect of Psycho's failure because your physique 
depends on more than just macro ratios and protein per pound. Taurine, carnosine, carnitine, EPA, DHEA, creatine, and glycine are all lacking in skinless chicken breast and in rice. And all of these have been shown to aid in exercise performance and body composition in some way. In fact, the chicken and rice diet is pretty much devoid of nutrients entirely, and the broccoli isn't going to do very much to add any of it back in. It doesn't have any of those things in it. For a scientific model to have power and usefulness, let alone correctness, it must have predictive power. Yet if you go by the psycho model, you will absolutely miserably fail to get the predicted results. You will always be working twice as hard or even 10 times as hard as you should to lose the weight. When you lose weight through fasting while eating a low carb diet, suddenly all these problems fly right out the window. That's because in reality the body works with hormonal feedback mechanisms. That's why in studies of alternate day fasting compared to daily prolonged calorie cutting, Fasting reduced insulin more quickly, lost more fat, and didn't lose any lean tissue. While the six month long diet group lost lean tissue, slowed metabolism, and lost less fat. Your body dictates not only your hunger levels, but also can reduce energy utilization to almost nothing. It can also sacrifice your organs to create energy and building materials, which greatly slows your metabolism in the long run. Naively trying harder to lose weight through longer and harder calorie cutting only makes these issues worse until often you can stop losing weight altogether. The number of meals eaten also matters. When you eat fewer meals per day and have a diet with adequate fat intake, insulin secretion is minimized because fat blunts insulin secretion. This means that you will absorb the food slower and be sated for longer. It also means you will absorb less of the fat and your body will even reject some more of the unhealthy fat and preferentially take up the natural healthy fats. When you constantly snack through the day on high carb foods, as our corrupt government suggests, the story is much different. Instead of a few moderate insulin bursts through the day, you have many short, sharp insulin bursts and you get hungry again a few hours later. Virtually everyone has experienced this effect themselves, the Chinese food effect as it were. When you do this over the course of months and years, insulin creeps up and up. So does cortisol, which is required to balance the excess insulin by making sure blood sugar does not go too low after the constant insulin spikes. Cortisol makes you very hungry and is very catabolic to the body when you are in a high insulin state. In fact, one of the main ways PEDs increase muscle size is that they block much of the body's catabolic response to cortisol. This leads to a vicious cycle where you are constantly hungry and always thinking of the next meal or snack. I would argue this constant grazing is a form of disordered eating and would not really have occurred before modern times, even though this disordered eating is exactly what dietitians today promote. This is really what carb addiction is all about. Once you smoke one, you'll want more, and more, and more. Unfortunately, the food industry essentially runs not just the FDA, but also the American Heart Association and the American Medical Association. These are essentially just lobbying organizations for big food and big pharma. In fact, if the AHA had gotten their way, we would never have been allowed to know trans fats are so unhealthy or that lineolic acid causes cancer. She found that it showed that the people still eating animal fats had less cancer and less heart disease. And the people eating the vegetable oils and the margarines had more cancer and more heart disease. She was able to publish an article in an obscure medical journal showing what she'd found and the article concluded by calling for more research into the trans fatty acids, which was her specialty. About three weeks after her article was published, she was called to a meeting at the University of Maryland. It was the entire uh, faculty in the lipids department, about five professors, all of the graduate students, and four representatives from the industry. There was someone from um, Unilever, um, Central Soya, Kraft Foods, and the Institute for Shortening and Edible Oils. And one of them had a stack of paper 
This was before the internet, so they were clipping uh, articles. And Mary's article in the journal got a lot of publicity. There was even an article in the National Enquirer about it. <laughs> and he was shaking with rage. They were furious that this had gotten out. And he said, you know, we watch the journals. And I thought my colleague was watching the journal that published your article, and he thought I was watching that journal. And we left the barn door open and a horse got out. And he said, this is not going to happen again. Imagine the arrogance of these people. They were controlling what was being published in the journals, and they admitted it. They were proud of it. This is the problem with relying on authority today. The journals have been corrupted and the philanthropic societies were founded to corrupt the education system and the medical profession. Speaking of unhealthy fats, it has been shown that lineolic acid destroys your mitochondria, which decreases your metabolism. It's also shown that stearic acid from beef has the opposite effect and boosts your mitochondria. Yet another way calories in, calories out fails, and in general it just fails to account for a low-carb diet. When people eat a low-carb diet, it's shown over and over again that they lose more weight. It's also shown over and over again that they wind up eating fewer calories. So even if you believe in psycho, it is very obvious that hormones have a strong effect on dietary compliance, which is going to affect how much you actually eat. Simply avoiding snacking and eating a set meal at mealtimes has been shown to lead to fewer calories consumed as well. So again, it is very obvious that behavior and compliance are driven by hormones, not moral turpitude. And this is just one of the major failures of psycho as a predictive model. On top of this, you actually burn more calories on a low-carb diet and have more functional mitochondria. Even Kevin Hall, who endlessly creates one-week industry-funded diets to prove psycho, has now admitted this is the case. And the reason these studies last only one week is because that's the maximum time you can fool yourself into believing carbs and fat have equal effects on the body, calorie for calorie. In fact, each individual fatty acid you consume has vastly different effects on the body, and this alone makes looking at mere macros completely pointless when it comes to analyzing diet from a weight loss perspective. When you put it all together, the solution to weight loss is simple, if not always easy. To avoid overeating, stop eating garbage foods full of sugar, wheat, and veg oil, and prefer lower carb, whole foods without oxalates or additives. To lose weight without slowing the metabolism and losing lean tissue, Try some 36 to 96 hour fasts. These can actually increase lean tissue where appropriate due to the increase in growth hormone and it also speeds up your metabolism. Fasting also has an endless list of health benefits in addition to weight loss and you've probably already seen this if you're watching this video. I won't say fasting is easy but it is infinitely more fruitful than losing the same 10 pounds over and over again like Oprah. On that note, I'll wrap things up for now, but I'll be back next week. Same fast time, same fast channel. Let's go, but inconspicuously. Through the window, we'll use our bat ropes. Our job is finished.